Welcome back to video number two of my it's not that hard to build a PC video series. So in this video, I will reassemble that AMD PC that I disassembled in the first video, which itself used to be a 2014 Intel PC that I upgraded with new AMD CPU, motherboard, Nvidia GPU and DDR4 memory towards the end of uh, 2020. However, the AIO water cooler, power supply and case were not upgraded at that time. With that system disassembled, it's time to initiate the build phase of the project where I will rebuild the AMD PC and the 2014 Intel PC for two reasons. One, for the AMD PC, since both the GPU and CPU can generate a lot of heat, I thought it might be a good idea to get a more efficient power supply, a case with better airflow, and also replace the age of the water cooler with a new one. And for the Intel PC, I need to build a home office machine. So I'm just going to reassemble that uh, 2014 system, which will be plenty for that kind of usage. In this video, I'm going to reassemble the AMD PC, but I'm going to do it with a new case, new water cooler and a new uh, power supply. This PC will be my main PC used for gaming, video editing and general use. The video will be split into two separate parts. Part A assembly and Part B which is post testing and troubleshooting. Disclaimer: I've been building and upgrading PCs for myself and the family for the past 25 years as an enthusiast. There was no YouTube or any nice instructional videos when I started, which means that I have few bad habits that will surely cause me some pain, such as not having a build plan before I build anything or not always reading the functional manual. So don't be like me, be better than me. When I do make mistakes, I will point them out in the video instead of cutting them out so you can learn. I'm not a professional system builder, so you should always refer to the instructions provided by your component manufacturer to ensure you don't wreck your stuff. My goal is to give you an idea of what type of challenges, mistakes, and tasks you might run into when building a system. And now let's go over the parts list. Although the 8-core AMD 5800X might not offer the best value in terms of dollar per core when compared to other Zen 3 CPUs, it was the easier one to get during the 2020 stock shortage. Also, for my personal use, 8 cores are just fine. For the GPU, I have the Asus Tough Gaming 3080X. I thought this was one of the more reasonably priced 3080s with good build quality and just enough RGBs to my taste. What just happened? Yes, I understand. For the GPU, I have the Asus Tough Gaming 3080X packed with the latest NVIDIA DLSS and RTX technology. I thought this was one of the more reasonably priced 3080s with good build quality and just enough RGB for my taste. For the motherboard, I went with the Asus Tough Gaming X570 Pro Wi-Fi, simply due to its availability and the fact that it's using the latest AMD chipset for the Ryzen CPU and the price was just about the max I want to spend on the motherboard anyway. For the CPU cooler, I went with the NZXT Kraken X63 AIO. I think it looks cool, and based on the reviews, it also performs cool too. Just don't install it in a NZXT H1 case, because that might negate its cooling performance. For power, I went with the Corsair TX750M, 750 watt AT Plus Gold Semi Modular PSU. My main requirement for a power supply is that it doesn't burn my house or my system down. For RAM, I have two 16GB 3200 Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro DDR4 RAMs. The RGBs easily let me know if the PC is in suspend mode from far away, and they also look nice. For the case, I went with the Corsair 4000D Airflow. I really like the price, which is right. The look, which is good, and its cooling performance, which is excellent. I also find that the tinted tempered glass allows for RGB light to shine through, but still darkens inside the case to hide the mess of wires if cable management is not your thing. Enough sightseeing, let's start to build. I'll start with opening the glass panel and placing the case on its right side to access the internals. The first order of business is to install the motherboard. Yes, William, 
I know that the thing to do these days is to install the CPU, RAM and so on on the motherboard before mounting it to the chassis, but I'm too lazy to move my camera setup here and this method, while not optimal, it still works. If you want the perfect build, go watch those other dozens of YouTube channels with billion more subscribers than mine that will humble shop here. You also notice that I'm not wearing an ESD wristband in this video since I couldn't find it around the house and I was too um, demotivated to keep looking for it. However, I came to regret this decision later when I started to test the system. No, I didn't wreck the PC with ESD, but a non-ESD issue was preventing the PC from booting, which I eventually figured out. But because I didn't wear the ESD band, I had doubt in my mind that I might have fried something due to ESD. Long story short, don't be like me, wear the ESD band. At least for the peace of mind of eliminating ESD from your troubleshooting. That's enough PSA, let's continue. I tried to locate the motherboard mounting holes on my case. I have an ATX size motherboard, so I'm going to use the ATX mounting locations. I need to make sure that a standoff is installed at each mounting hole. The motherboard should never be mounted onto the chassis directly without standoffs. This particular case has standoffs pre-installed, so I am good to go. Also notice that a pin exists instead of a standoff in the middle of the case. This pin allows me to easily align my motherboard to the chassis by matching the middle hole of the motherboard to the pin. I now insert the motherboard into the case while ensuring that the external connectors on the back of the motherboard are going to come out from the back of the case. Some of you might already have noticed that I made a mistake and I skipped a step. Can you guess what? Yep, I forgot to install the IO shield. I will realize this minor oversight at a later point. Anyway, I hope you notice how I use the middle pin to help align the motherboard during insertion. I proceed to making slight positional adjustment to the motherboard to align the mounting holes to the standoffs, while still totally oblivious that I forgot the IO shield. Using my magnetic screwdriver, I begin to fasten the motherboard screws. I do this in two passes. The first pass is to loosely fasten the screws, and once everything is in place, I proceed to tighten the screws without over tightening them. It's very important not to over tighten the screws since that can actually cause problems with the operation of the system or damage the motherboard, as we will discover later on during troubleshooting. This is an ATX size motherboard, so it has three mount points at the bottom of the motherboard, three at the middle, counting the alignment pin, and three at the top for a total of nine mounting points. Once I finish with all the motherboard screws, it's time to install the CPU. I begin by locating the CPU socket on the motherboard. This particular socket is an AM4 socket, which has the pin holes on the motherboard, while the actual pins are on the CPU. I need to unlock the CPU socket by lifting the release lever up. As you can see, moving the lever changes the socket alignment to lock or unlock the CPU in place. Using the small triangle indicators present on the CPU and the socket, I align the CPU to the socket to the correct orientation. The CPU can go in the socket in only one orientation, since it is keyed, so I need to make sure I get the orientation right. I gently insert the CPU into the socket. It should go in with no effort, hence the socket type 0 insertion force. Remember, you can install the CPU before installing the motherboard if you choose to. I finally press the lever down to lock the CPU into the socket. Now I move on to the NVMe drives that I will refer to as NVMe starting now. I need to locate the M2 PCIe slot and the NVMe mounting hole. NVMe cards also require standoffs. Not all motherboards come with NVMe standoffs, so better to check the manual. I take my first NVMe card and align it to the M2 slot. A notch present on the M2 slot and the NVMe allows me to determine the correct orientation. Once in position, I gently push the card into the slot. The other end of the NVMe card will remain raised. This is normal. I need to gently push the raised end toward the standoff until it is level and then screw it in place. There should be no resistance felt as I push down the card. I then repeat the same process for my second NVMe card. Time to install the two DDR4 DIMMs. Since these are double data rate RAMs, they will perform best when installed as pairs. I'm going to install two 16GB modules for a total of 32GB of RAM. 
I need to make sure the dim socket levers shown on the left here are pushed down to the unlock position. They will relock automatically once I push the dim into the slot. The DR4 dim slots are also keyed to ensure that only the DR4 dims are used and only in the correct orientation. Each dim needs to be installed on the correct channel for best performance. My motherboard I have here has four slots grouped into two channels. In order to get the doubled speed, I need to ensure that each channel has at least one dim installed. For two dims, my motherboard manual recommends using the first uh, slot, which is channel A, and the third slot, channel B, with the first slot being the furthest from the CPU. Time to prepare the motherboard to install the AIO pump. You'll notice the four AIO standoffs are on the CPU here. These are the standoffs from the old Corsair water cooler that I forgot to remove during disassembly in the first video. The motherboard comes with standard air cooler clips out of the box. I'll switch the standoffs with the new ones that come with the new AIO just to be sure everything fits. The CPU backplate separates when the cooler bracket slash standoffs are removed. I need to make sure that I don't forget about the CPU backplate to give standoffs something to attach to. Oh boy, due to fatigue after filming for several hours, I start making a very dumb mistake and screw the standoffs the wrong way. And here I am correcting the mist uh, I mean uh, learning opportunity several shoots later. A facepalm moment for sure, but since I didn't jam in the standoffs, it's easily correctable. I prepared the rad for direct installation by sandwiching the rad between the fans and the case. Another way to install the rad is indirectly, which is by sandwiching the fans between the case and the rad. I also need to think about the location and orientation of how the rad will be installed in the case, since that will also determine the orientation I want to install the fans so the wires of the fan come out as close to the chassis as possible for better cable management. I also need to decide about airflow orientation to either push or pull air into the rad and the chassis itself. It's very important to use the right screw length and mount location when installing the fans on the rad, otherwise you might accidentally damage the radiator fins and cause leaks. I am going to install the fans in the exhaust orientation, meaning that the air will be pulled from inside the case to the outside, because I plan to install the radiator at the top of the case. A common practice in computer cases is to have the intake fans at the front of the case and exhaust fans at the back and top, called neutral pressure. However, other setups such as positive pressure and negative pressure are also used by some users. I installed the second fan following the same procedures. Time for a quick dry fit to see if the radiator and the fans will fit between the case and the motherboard. Unfortunately, due to the large heatsink on the motherboard, I will not be able to install the radiator on the top as you can see. I double checked the case manual to make sure it really supports a 280mm radiator on the top and it does, it's just the motherboard is getting in the way. Fortunately for me, the case supports a vertical front mounted 280mm radiator, so I have one more option to work with. To accommodate a front rat setup, I need to move the pre-installed front intake fan to the top of the case as an exhaust fan but that means that I have to flip the exhaust fans on the rad into ATIC fans. However, I'm not sure how I feel about the radiator blowing warmer air into the case, since it's not something I've done before. I just haven't done the research for this kind of setup. However, it's also very late into the night and I just want to get this build done. I will set up the top fans as intake and leave the radiator and back fans to do the exhaust. It will trigger some people for sure, but it's okay since I can just change the fan setup later when I do my cable management after testing the build. Hey, I can even put a dust filter on the top for now, so it's no big deal. The show must go on. Besides, it will be fun to test the performance of the setup versus a more traditional one. The fan itself was a simple affair to remove, but it was sure screwed on tight. Thanks, Corsair. Time to do another radiator dry fit test, but this time with a vertical orientation at the front of the case. I just need to make sure that the tubes going to my rad are the top with the rad mounted as close to the top of the case as possible. 
And that's only because I want to ensure that the pump is never the highest point of the AIO loop since air bubbles will rise to the highest point and I don't want any air trap into the pump. Finally, time to install the radiator. I put the case on its side to make the job easier. Please note that the screw I'm showing here is the incorrect type of screw to use when mounting the rat directly to the chassis, at least for this brand. The screw is so long that it can get into the fins of the radiator and damage them, potentially causing leaks or cooling performance issue. Therefore, it is very important to read the full manual. AIO kits come with several types of screws. It's easy to make mistakes when you're tired or impatient. So please never force anything in a PC while you're building. Now I'm going to pull out the correct screw size and begin securing the radiator into the case. I will need to align the radiator to the correct position and hold it by hand while I place the few initial screws. I just want to loosely tighten the screws first, which will allow me to sort of slide the radiator into the final position before I really begin to tighten it. With the radiator secured, it's time to install the pump. I try to first determine the orientation of the pump for both functional and aesthetic reasons. Any direction that the pump fit can work. Hmm, that doesn't feel or look right. The tubes are bending too much. I'll try a few other ways until I find something that works for me. Notice here that I have lifted protective plastic on the cold plate to avoid accidentally spreading pre-applied thermal paste to my hands or components. This pump comes pre-installed with an Intel retention bracket, but I need to remove it and install the one intended for the AMD CPU. The IO comes with both options. Time to gently and evenly place the pump on the CPU. I need to make sure I align the retention bracket with the standoffs I installed earlier. I make sure the pump is properly sitting on the CPU and I avoid sliding it around not to prematurely spread the thermal paste from the cold plate. Also the NZXT logo display on the top of this pump can be rotated to face the correct orientation. Time to secure the pump to the CPU using the provided screws. Again, I need to evenly distribute the pressure on the CPU by turning each screw a little bit and then move on to the next. AIOs are a lot of work, so I can understand if you're more of an air cooler person. Speaking of air coolers, I will be using a Noctua air cooler for the Intel PC rebuild, so make sure to watch that video when it's out. I will do the final tightening by using my hands to ensure that I don't over tighten the pump as that can potentially interfere with the operation of the CPU. Time to install the fans at the top of the case. I first installed a fan that came pre-installed, which I removed earlier. I also have an older fan sitting around that I'm going to use as a second top fan. However, once I install that fan, I won't be able to get to my EPS power connector on the motherboard, so I will put the fan aside and connect the EPS power first. My system requires an 8-pin EPS power connector to the CPU. Here I have an 8-pin EPS extender cable that I'm using for the looks, but I can also just use the cable that comes in my power supply directly if I want to. I snap these two 4 pin connectors together to form an 8 pin connector and then plug that into the motherboard in the correct orientation. The pins are keyed so they can only be installed in one orientation. I now install the second fan. Although this fan didn't come with the case, the case did come with the mounting hardware required. Before I move on to installing the GPU, I need to start connecting all the wires and connectors to the motherboard, since it will be very hard to do that when a GPU the size of a 1980s car phone is installed in there. I start by locating the wires and connectors required by the PC case. These typically include front audio, USB 3, power LED, power switch, and reset switch. If you're not sure, read the manual. My cables are neatly tucked away behind the motherboard tray, so I will need to route them to the other side using many of the pass-through slots provided by the case. I want to take a few moments deciding from which slot to pass the cables through to ensure correct reach and minimizing wire visibility on the motherboard side. I connect the USB-C header. It looks like it's keyed, so it should only go one way. It's my first time installing one of these. 
Now to install the front audio connector, which is also keyed as one of the pinholes is filled in. Now the USB 3 header, which is always fun to install. This one is also keyed. Remember the IO shield that I forgot to install earlier? I finally noticed it now, after all this time. Luckily, I was able to quickly unscrew the motherboard and lift it enough from the back end to just sneak the IO shield in place without having to undo really anything else. Of course, this was all staged for uh, educational purposes. Back on track, I proceed to connecting the power LED, power switch, and reset switch. It's best to refer to the motherboard manual on where to install these. There is also a USB 2 header that connects the AIO 3 motherboard, which I connected here off camera. Now time to connect the fans and pumps to the motherboard. Although these are fairly straightforward, each motherboard or AIO has its own header locations and requirement, so it's best to, you guessed it, read the fulfilling manual. And onto the 24 pin ATX power connector. Here I'm using the extender cable for the looks, but connecting the cable from the PSU directly also works fine. The time has come to install the hefty 3080 RTX GPU. I first try a dry fit to ensure nothing gets in the way and also to determine which expansion slot bay the card will be secured to. I proceed to removing the two expansion bay slot covers in order to make room for the GPU. Before installing the GPU, I need to make sure the PCIe lock is set to unlock position. I install the GPU into the top PCIe 16X slot. I align the GPU to the PCIe slot and gently push it in. The lock should snap into place once the card is pushed in. While still supporting the weight of the heavy card in my hand, I begin screwing the GPU into place. I secure both brackets properly as the card is quite heavy. I don't want it to move around when I plug in a monitor as that might cause damage or system crash. I connect two PCIe 6 plus 2 pin power cables to the GPU. Again, I'm using extension cables here for the looks, but the original PS2 cable will work just fine. These 6.2 connectors can be slightly frustrating to work with, since sometimes the 2 pin connector will fall out while plugging the 6 pin connector. The 6 pin connector has a notch to ensure it goes in one way and a clip to secure it into place. The 2 pin connector doesn't have the clip, but it's still keyed for correct orientation. Once the GPU power is connected, I route the wires to the back of the case. I won't spend time making the cables look good until I test the PC. I will make things pretty later. Time to install the power supply at the bottom of the case under the shroud. I noticed that the case comes with the traditional hard drive mounting brackets. I'm not planning to install any traditional hard disks, so I can remove these to have more room to stuff my power cables in. Now on to the actual power supply. I install it with the large intake fan facing down since my case has an intake spot for it at the bottom. Before completely securing the power supply to the case, it is a good idea to connect any of the modular cables that I need, such as the PCIe for the graphic cards, set out to power the pump, and so on. After I connect all the modular cables, I can position the PSU into place and screw it into the chassis. I connect my extension cables such as ATX24 pin, EPS, PCIe 2.6 to the PSU's cables. Oof, I almost forgot to connect the AIO pump power to the SATA connector. There's more than one way for the CPU to be affected by meltdown, I guess. Alright, we are almost done with assembling the system. Now it's just time to secure the power supply into the chassis using these four screws here. And after that, it's time to test the system to see if it's going to work. And here's the assembled system without any cable management. As I said before, I'll do the testing first before I start working on the cables. All right, let's see if the system will post. Now the amber LED on the top 
write is on, which means it's a very, very, very fine memory. And unfortunately, it's stuck there. It means that it cannot get past memory verification. So there's definitely something wrong, and that's why I'm going to troubleshoot this and come back through the magic of video editing, explaining what happened. Thankfully, the next day, after several hours of troubleshooting, I was able to track down the problem to the motherboard and the fact that there was a screw that was actually tied in too much, believe it or not, and was preventing the motherboard from working. I have never seen this problem before. I was a bit nervous. I thought, you know, I had damaged my CPU or the motherboard or one of the memories or the ch channels because of EST or something like that. But nope, it was a tight screw. In the future, I will create a part B to this video where I will go over the troubleshooting steps that I did to get to the solution and also the other type of validation that I do in software to just to make sure that the system is up and running properly. All right, with that out of the way, time to do some basic cable management. Warning, I do the bare minimum for cable management, pretty much just good enough because my PC just is under my desk. I don't really look at it. I occasionally look at it, but I just, you know, as long as it's clean, fairly clean, I don't mind. So I'll just, you know, it's my first time trying to sort of comb these cables. And yeah, so I'll just kind of put it together, uh, clean up the cables a little bit here, and here's the finished result. Again, it's not too bad, and especially with the tinted glass, you know, you just, it's not really that visible anyway. So again, it doesn't have the perfect, I don't put it on display or anything like that, but at least it's, there's just some attempt to clean this up a little bit here. And now time to close the back panel. Hopefully with all those cables behind it, it will go in. Yeah, it looks like it's good. And finally, I will test the system one more time to make sure it posts because I was playing with the cables just to make sure I didn't dis disconnect anything. And it looks like it's going to work. Good. That's it. So now we'll put the front panel on and this computer is ready for use. And that's it. We're done with this AMD build. Now, was that really that hard? Sure, there's a lot of things to do and steps to follow. But really, if you look through the videos, I'm just putting stuff together in, in a certain sequence. And I'm not even necessarily following the right sequence. I made some mistakes in the way. But that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. As long as you can follow some basic instructions, you're patient and not reckless, and you have the interest, I think anyone can build their PC. The only PC that I ever bought pre-built was the first PC that I had when I was again 15. And after that, I started building my own and I really love it. But also, if you're not into building PCs or you never built one before, it's totally okay if you want to go buy one that's pre-built you know there's nothing wrong with that it's not for everyone I just enjoy it but especially your first PC getting it pre-built there's no shame in it uh, but if you're interested later on and you want to upgrade things yourself uh, and do things yourself then you know there are plenty of resources Now, my video that I did here is not necessarily a tutorial because I'm just doing my thing for my I'm not necessarily following best practices but again the point was to show that here anyone can pretty much do it even when you goof up now, there are a lot of resources out there, you know, YouTube videos showing you step by step how to build a computer using the proper method and procedure or maybe best practices. Uh, and yeah, so you can look forward to those if you're really, really interested in building your own PC for the first time. My advice is always to always check out multiple sources and then make your decision because only you know what's best, the best fit for your situation. People will give you all sorts of advice and tell you all sorts of things. This is the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. And they may be right. They may not. They or they may not be right. So you need to take in information and decide what's best for you. And the best way to do that is to have a few sources, different perspective, where you gather information and you make your own decision. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'm hoping to provide more content in the future if there's an interest. So thank you and hope to see you soon.